So I remind you, so end of the proof, so the, the, we, we want to prove that, uh, so we have a variation of attractions on a smooth quasi-projective variety S, and then we get a period map phi from uh, S n to uh, some S gamma uh, gm, which is a quotient of some uh, period domain D by uh, gamma, which is an arithmetic group in uh, G, and G is a generic Mumford group of your variation of attractions. And so we explained last time that you are reduced uh, to the following, to studying uh, local period maps. So this means that we look at uh, the restriction of phi uh, after uh, compactifying S uh, by uh, a strict normal crossing divisor. So we are reduced to prove that uh, when you look at uh, what happens locally at infinity, so we get this uh, period map from the start to the end to S gamma GM. And we want to prove uh, uh, um, that this is R and exp uh, definable. Yes, so delta is a disk, delta star is a punctured disk, and I take uh, this product. But you could also be this locally cross delta <coughs> Yeah, but I don't need it because in some sense I can admit that some of them are trivial. Okay, you can, it's enough. Yeah. <laughs> this is enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is what uh, we want to prove. And uh, as I explained last time, uh, the situation is as follows. You look at the universal cover, so you have uh, the upper half plane to, uh, to the n. And inside this, uh, we have uh, the Ziegel set that I defined last time. Right? And so you have this period map in restriction to those Ziegel set going to uh, the universal cover D, which is uh, G mod M. And then, uh, so this is the lift of my period map. And here I have my period map. And uh, I explained last time, uh, we redu reduced to uh, proving. So using the nilpotent orbit theorem, it's easy to see that this map is uh, an expert definable. And then to conclude that this one is, we had to prove that uh, uh, this uh, phi of uh, this Ziegel set is contained infinitely many. Ziegel set here. D. And then, uh, as I explained uh, last time, but let me repeat it. Uh, so for n is equal to 1, this was proven uh, by uh, Schmidt. And we will use it later. Uh, in general, um, and this is a consequence of uh, uh, the SL2 orbit theorem. Uh, in general, uh, this is uh, more tricky, and this is what I want to explain uh, today. So uh, the idea is that you use the fact that your variation of our structures give you a, a rational representation of your generic Manforte group in GLV. And so this induces uh, the following picture. First, you have D, which is G mod M. Then you can project it to the associated uh, locally symmetric space, G mod K. K is, in fact, the unique maximal compact containing that M. And then uh, this guy can be embedded inside uh, the symmetric space associated to uh, X, to uh, GLV. So uh, this is GLVR. Uh, let's write it this way. Uh, modulo uh, maximal compact. Well, I can even choose SLV if I want to simplify. Um, SOR. So, so I'll it this way. And so, uh, what is this map? Uh, if you have a point Z in uh, this period domain, really what you are associating to it is just uh, the odd norm seen as a real quadratic form, HZ. So Yes, I use the nature of so uh, defining uh, the VHS V uh, on S. 
right? Because this group is a generic Montforte group, so it has a canonical representation. It is a generic Montforte group. So it has a canonical representation in. Yes. Okay. It's just because I didn't want to have to, to write the center here. Okay. So a symmetric space. Of GLVR. Okay. So this is just a set of uh, norms up to a uh, on that vector space uh, VR. Okay. And uh, and why are we doing this? Well, I, I recalled you last time these properties of Ziegel sets. So we want to prove that the image of uh, sigma h to the n is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets here. But uh, this is uh, what I claim is that this is enough to prove that this is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets here, because the preimage of a Ziegel set here is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets here. This is what I uh, recalled you last time. Okay. So in fact, and now the second step is to say that. Okay, I understand the Ziegel sets here. Basically, this is just a property of being reduced, have a reduced form with respect to some norm, right? So this is what we did last time. And so uh, the theorem that we have to prove, as we control uh, Ziegel sets uh, in X, it is enough uh, to prove uh, the following uh, result that uh, let sigma n be a set of uh, elements in h to the n such that uh, the real parts, so xi is the real part of zi, uh, are between 0 and 1, and uh, y1 is larger or equal to y2, larger to equal to uh, yn, which is larger than 1. So. Uh, as I explained last time, if you take into account all possible uh, permutation of the coordinates, those guys will cover uh, your Ziegel set to the power n. And so to prove that you are contained in finitely many Ziegel sets, it's enough to prove that the image of each of those guys is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets. And now Ziegel sets are uh, contained in those set of reduced uh, elements. So you want to prove that there exists a basis E of uh, VQ and a constant and C larger than zero, uh, such that for any uh, Z in uh, that guy sigma n, the norm HZ is EC reduced. So I introduced uh, this when I discussed uh, the Ziegel sets uh, for uh, X. So let me recall uh, the definition, maybe, because obviously, if you are like me, you forgot. So, uh, so I remind you the definition that I gave last time. So let E being uh, E1 up to EN uh, basis of uh, VQ. And let's see a positive constant. Then uh, an element B in X. Uh, is uh, EC reduced if uh, well you look at your quadratic form uh, then you have this property on the vector of your basis so anyway this one is positive definite so I don't need an absolute value uh, so this is the first condition the second condition is that B of, uh, you have some, uh, to respect some order, and uh, at last uh, you have to bound the uh, product, so you take care of the determinant, uh, the product for i is equal 1 to n uh, is smaller than c times the determinant of B. Uh, okay, so this was the definition, and these are the conditions classically given by a uh, reduction theory. All right, so uh, this is what we want to do, and I introduced the basics, uh, the basic notation last time. So let me uh, maybe uh, remind them. 
So I introduced uh, the ring O, which was the ring uh, of functions on uh, sigma n, uh, by obtained by pullback. Uh, via uh, the projection uh, p from h n to delta star to the n uh, of restricted analytic function on uh, this uh, delta n of restricted uh, analytic functions on delta n. Then uh, you can take polynomials in x, uh, y, and also y minus 1. So this is a ring of polynomials uh, in z1, in x1, xn, y1, uh, yn, and uh, y1 minus 1, yn minus 1, uh, with coefficient in O. Yes, and uh, we have uh, its fraction field o of x, y. And uh, I introduced a class of nice function into those rings, which was uh, roughly a monomial and polynomial function. So the definition was uh, let f in o of x, y, then it is uh, said to be a roughly monomial. Uh, if uh, y is equivalent to uh, y1, s1, yn, sn for some integers, uh, possibly negative one, of course, for some integers, si. And uh, it is said to be a roughly polynomial. If uh, it is of the form uh, y, um, f, sorry, f, uh, f, if is g over h, where uh, h is roughly monomial and g is a polynomial. g is in O, x, y, y minus 1, and h is roughly monomial. Yes, and maybe I should have introduced the, the notations that I'm using which uh, were that uh, uh, the equivalence uh, was that f, so if there exists a constant such that and uh, f is equivalent to g if, um, if uh, f Just in the neighborhood of uh, when you go, when you shrink uh, delta star to the when you when you go to the did you say the y goes to infinity or yes when was y is go to infinity so this is for y bigger than something yes you are you are you are always working anyway here so all the y i's are larger than one and you ask that there exists constants so you have this when you go to infinity. All the, okay, and, and you take absolute value also. Oh yeah, sure, sure, yes. And the restricted analytic functions means that they are <coughs> analytic on some larger. Restricted analytic function is the sense of is in the sense of last time. This means that basically you are zero outside a compact, and on a compact you are restriction of uh, analytic function. Okay. But again, you you may have to rest. Okay. Uh. All right, so uh, this is it. And why was it useful, uh, this class? Uh, it, was, it was a claim. So the claim was uh, that uh, f is roughly polynomial. Uh, and uh, suppose that g is roughly monomial. So uh, you see that basically uh, the kind of conditions that you want to test are exactly this kind of uh, being much smaller than. So right? these are exactly the conditions that appear here. And the claim is that for functions uh, satisfying those conditions, then you can test it. Then 
f is uh, uh, is uh, uh, much uh, smaller than g on sigma n if and only if it is true in restriction to curves in restriction so this is an easy computation uh, to curves uh, tau of the following form uh, um, tau was uh, given by a system of equation uh, alpha 1 z1 plus beta 1 is equal to blah blah is equal to alpha n0 uh, z0 plus beta uh, n0 and then you fixed uh, the next variable uh, z n0 plus 1 is some constant uh, zeta n0 plus 1 and z n is a constant of the form zeta n uh, for some uh, alpha in uh, q positive and beta i in r and uh, uh, zeta i's in sigma n. Okay. So this is the interest of these functions and basically you see that uh, we'll be reduced to uh, proving uh, 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 that our functions, our norm functions are uh, of this type. Okay, so uh, let me now explain the argument. So the first proposition is that your norm functions are uh, roughly polynomial. The structure of the proof is the following. Proposition A is that uh, for any uv in uh, Vc, the function of z, which is az of uv, so this is a function that belongs to my ring, and uh, it is roughly polynomial. On sigma n. And uh, second uh, is that uh, if you restrict to the diagonal, so you look at uh, AZ of U, then uh, it is roughly monomial. And this proposition will tell you that you are in business because uh, then what you want to prove is this kind of inequality uh, between uh, those functions. So uh, this one, for instance, will be roughly monomial and this one will be roughly polynomial. And so you will be able to test this kind of inequality only arguing uh, in restriction to curves. And then in restriction to curves, we'll use a Schmidt result in dimension one. How do you know this is like in O, X, Y round? Now this is a claim. This is part of the proposition. Is that this function uh, belongs to that ring and that it is roughly polynomial. Okay. Okay, but then when you take the fraction field, you get six, which are which are not defined somewhere. They could be infinity somewhere. Yes. So this means that the frac the denominator is not is not uh, the, the denominator is not vanishing. Yeah. Okay, it could also be really the cancellation. Okay, it doesn't start it from the I'm just sketching. I'm not giving uh, all the details. So this is proposition A. Why is that you have to consider real beta in the equations? Uh. I don't understand the difference between alpha and br. Uh, no, I wrote it that way because I think, in fact, this is enough. But uh, no, you see, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, I should take, I should take um, uh, in sigma h, right? I mean, but I, I want my point to the total points has to have to be in sigma n, right? So this is like, yeah, this is not really sigma n. I mean, let's write it in h and uh, in h, okay? I, th I think this is fine. Okay, so uh, suppose you have proposition A, and I, I will come back to this proposition uh, uh, a bit later. So what is the second point? So the uh, second point is suppose B that uh, we have a basis. E uh, is equal to E1 EN of VQ 
uh, such that uh, there exists a constant C1. Oops. There exists uh, C1 larger than 0, such that you have only the third condition here. Such that the product uh, of this Hz of Ei uh, is smaller than C1. For i is equal 1 to n. Uh, for all z in uh, sigma n. Then I claim that if you have this proposition A and if you are able to exhibit such a basis satisfying only the third uh, condition, then you are done. So that is uh, condition C uh, for Hz to be EC1 reduced. Right? OK, so uh, how does it work? Now, uh, for any curve tau uh, as here, so for any curve tau uh, as uh, above, it's not above, it was above on my sheet, but of course, uh, as in the claim, uh, then what happens? Well, you apply Schmidt theorem. Uh, for n is equal to 1, so you can apply it because you are working with a curve, it will tell you that, uh, uh, implies that if you look at, y so, okay. that yota, y so yota was that map going from, uh, so I call this yota. Uh, okay, so uh, it tells you that yota uh, applied to phi tilde of uh, z, uh, lies, or tau, let's say, uh, yeah, z, uh, lies in a set uh, of uh, e tau, c tau uh, reduced forms. Right? Schmidt theorem tells you that if you apply to curves, then you know that you lie in finitely many ziggle sets. So that you can find a basis. Uh, e tau, depending on tau, of course, and a constant c tau, depending on tau, such that uh, you are in that set of e tau, c tau reduced form. Okay? And the problem is the uniformity. You want to exhibit an e independent of tau and a constant independent of tau. So let's do that. So what was the crucial uh, claim that I also stated when I gave that example about uh, EC reduced form? Uh, let me uh, recall what was the claim. So but this is after some shrinking because you are working on an open disk, so you don't control near the bar. I mean, you control it and you shrink slightly the bit. The no, I don't have to shrink anything. The constant will depend on everything, but that's it. The constant that I choose depends on tau, but I don't, I don't, I don't have to, uh, to shrink ah, okay. oh, anything. Yes. So uh, the claim that I stated also last time is that if you have, uh, it was that if you have b in x, which is uh, e prime c prime reduced, and if you know that you satisfy the set condition, uh, uh, um, and e is a basis uh, for which condition C uh, is satisfied and holds for some constant, then in fact there is a, uh, another constant depending only on E C E prime C prime such that uh, B is also E C double prime reduced. Okay, so uh, this was the crucial claim uh, last time about this uh, reduced form. So uh, you apply this here, you are in the situation where uh, by uh, my assumption B, uh, the condition uh, C is satisfied, 
And here I have exhibited uh, uh, this uh, form satisfying exactly this E tau C tau uh, reducedness. So uh, this implies that there exists another constant C tau, but let me uh, uh, say it in, in the same, uh, write it in the same way, such that uh, yota phi of uh, tau uh, lies yeah, yeah, this tau. Uh, lies in uh, a set of uh, E, so now E is, is fixed, and only the constant depends on tau, of E C tau reduced form. Right? So uh, these nice properties of uh, E C reduced form tells you that you get the uniformity in the basis. What is the determinant in condition C? Wait. This is what I'm saying. I started assuming that I found it such a base, satisfying the condition C. Suppose you have a basis. I, must, I, must, I start with a basis satisfying condition C. Then I apply in dimension 1 to all my curves a Schmidt result. I exhibit a cont another basis, E tau, C tau, such that in restriction to that curve, I am E tau, C tau reduced. Then I, apply, that I apl apl apply this claim, and I say that because E satisfied the condition C already, then uh, I know that changing maybe the, con the constant C tau, then in fact, for each of those curves, uh, there are E C tau reduced. But now the question is why don't you have the determinant on your inequality? Mm? I think he's asking why do you, you don't put the determinant in the inequality after. Ah, okay, because... Uh, well, the star is a form which is known, which is over Z, so it has the, the determinant of the original symmetric or anti-symmetric form is, is known. But okay, so... Uh, you, you change it using the value of... Okay. You have to put it here. But anyway, you, well, in fact, you can scale everything so that you reduce to forms of determinant 1. This is not a big deal, but... Okay, uh, determinant of HZ for uh, Z in uh, sigma n, okay? Sorry, it's just because uh, this was the original way it was written. Uh, okay. Uh, in particular, uh, once you are here, uh, you know that uh, you know that uh, uh, um, uh, you have this first condition A. In particular, this tells you that H Z of uh, E I E J in absolute value is much smaller than HZ of EI for uh, Z in tau. Well, of course, the constant here depends on tau. But now uh, you apply the fact that you are uh, roughly polynomial. So as Z gives uh, HZ of EI EJ is roughly polynomial, and as Z gives uh, HZ of EI is roughly monomial, then uh, the criterion by restriction to curves uh, tau uh, gives that uh, uh, in fact you have uniformly now independent of tau, you have Hz of Ei Ej is uh, much smaller than Hz of Ei, now uniformly for Z in uh, uh, sigma n. Okay? That is, there exists a constant uh, independent of tau, such that, uh, well, uh, this I want to keep, this I want to keep, and this I can erase. That is, uh, there exists a constant C2 such that uh, uh, this function 
I can be compared like this for uh, now n is the in sigma n. Okay? So now you take c being the max of c1, c2, and you get that uh, yota uh, phi of uh, z tilde is easy, ec reduced for all z in sigma n. Yeah, here there is no difference. There is uh, there is no difference. You could treat A and B in the same way. Yes. <coughs> you also have to shrink now, really, because your this condition is symptomatic. This uh, lemma claim. Is yeah, but uh, it's uh, it's written here when I say that basic when I wrote this one, right? Uh, okay, but anyway, if you are working on compact things, then you have some inequality. Yes. Okay, so this is the ID and um, without too many details, and then it remains to show A and B. Those two statements. Okay, and this is asymptotic Hodge theory. So you really look at the degeneration of uh, Hodge structures. So uh, let's try to do that. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, A and B follows from a classical uh, study of uh, degeneration uh, of hot structures. So if you have a variation of hot structure and uh, you degenerate it uh, at infinity, then you will go to uh, limiting mixed hot structures. So let me recall a few things about uh, mixed hot structures. So, uh, so I remind you the definition. I think I gave it last time. But maybe I will write it. So you want to have your uh, increasing filtration on VQ, your weight filtration. You have your hot filtration on uh, VC. And uh, you want that this thing satisfied that the Gre WL VQ is a pure of weight uh, L, right? And as I explained, the same thing as a, a bi-grading. And this is important for what follows. Uh, the sum of the IRS where uh, WL is uh, the sum uh, for R plus S uh, smaller than N, then FP is the sum for R larger than P of uh, IRS. And uh, the condition is that uh, IRS bar, the complex conjugate, is ISR. Not exactly, but uh, mod uh, the sum of the i a b for a uh, smaller than r and b smaller than r strictly. Okay, and I explained that uh, uh, you say that you are split. So uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. This is badly written. This is i s r here. The condition of l a and b as well so is r and s of r. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, so you want, you say that this thing is split, is R split, if uh, IRS is ISR. Uh, okay. So... Uh, and then I, I, uh, I said that the link proves that you can, if you start from any uh, VZWF, then you can associate to this canonically uh, a split one of the form uh, VZ. Of course, you keep the same uh, weight filtration, but you change the arch filtration modifying f uh, by some endomorphism 
so this is R split uh, uh, delta is canonically chosen in this uh, sum. Okay, so now let me uh, recall the generation. And this is where things become to be uh, complicated in many variables. So you start with Vz, you have your uh, weight filtration, so your variation of our structures. You have, sorry, you, don't have, you have the holomorphic vector bundle associated to it, uh, V. Uh, Nabla, the flat connection, and F, your Hodge filtration. And uh, you are on delta star to the n. You have your variation of attractions on delta star to the n. Where is delta? Because delta is here. Delta is here. So this is, this is a way of modifying. Then <coughs> if you write delta, it is the direction of J of Ah, J, A, B. So you, you choose the pieces of the filtration uh, for the Lie algebra so that you are in neg negatively guided. Right, this is this Lie algebra is the hot structures, and so you take those pieces. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Sure. Uh, and you assume that you have unipotent monodromy, so with unipotent monodromy Ti's, and uh, you write them as uh, last week, exponential of Ni. Uh, and, and i is nilpotent. Right. And then, uh, what I claim is that uh, out of this data, uh, you will produce uh, mixed hot structures. So uh, to do this, maybe let first let me uh, recall the standard tool in this, which is uh, uh, the Monroe filtration. So the remark, uh, classical remark of the Lean is that if n is a nilpotent uh, endomorphism uh, of VQ, yeah, those guys are rational. I mean, uh, yeah. So this is important. Then uh, associated to this, you get a filtration uh, W of n, uh, the Monroe filtration on VQ, and it is characterized by the following properties that uh, N of uh, WNL is contained, it shifts uh, this filtration uh, by two, and uh, if you look, you have a hard left sheets integrated in this data, namely the Gre for uh, this monoromy filtration L is isomorphic when you apply NL to uh, the Gre uh, minus L uh, WN. Okay, so this is SL2 triple uh, business, as usual. So uh, now, uh, of course, the problem is that we have many filtrations, and the order we'll consider uh, the variables uh, will give different results, and this is why you have this, the introduction of this sigma n for the asymptotic. So let's do that. So let C be uh, the cone, the open cone generated by uh, the monodromies, and j. Lambda j, uh, lambda j uh, positive, strictly. So this is an open convex cone uh, of gr, the Lie algebra, uh, generated by uh, the log of the monoromies. Then, uh, so I guess finally I will erase this. So uh, what is the classical theory? The classical theory tells you the following, that for j, uh, uh, any subset of uh, 1n, then you can look at the cone cj contained in the closure of uh, this cone c, so the facet corresponding to j, so this is uh, the set of uh, 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 linear combination, but only now for the parameters in your uh, given subset uh, with lambda j. Uh, positive, and uh, so this is a facet of, uh, you have this cone and you have uh, finitely many facets in the closure, and the basic result of Catani and Kaplan, which was really uh, the, the beginning of the business in uh, many variables, 
is that uh, all, if you take any element in that cone, uh, any n in Cj, uh, determine the same filtration W uh, Cj uh, on Vr. Right? So the uh, mohan uh, filtration that you get uh, depends only on the facet, not really on the true uh, element that you are considering. And in particular, uh, because this guy contains uh, rational vectors, rational elements, you see that this filtration is defined over Q. In particular, Right? I mean, for the elements which are not defined over Q, of course, the Lin's theorem still apply, but you get only something over R. But uh, as you know that this is independent and you have rational vectors, then everything is fine and it's defined over Q. Okay, so this means that for each facet, but you see that uh, uh, this is really uh, the facet, the, the set of, the subset of one end that you are considering that plays an important role. Then uh, what uh, Schmidt and uh, uh, SL2 orbit in one variable tells you, SL2 orbit uh, in one variable. So this is the only SL2 orbit we use. Uh, but of course it is crucial. It tells you that if you uh, take the underlying uh, module to your uh, Z variation for structure, then uh, as a weight filtration, you, uh, you take uh, the uh, Modromi filtration given by one facet, and then uh, you have to shift it so that this is centered in zero. K, so K is the original weight. K weight. Yeah, I think uh, I was confusing the notation at some point to as n, but now n is the number of variables, so uh, let's call it k. k uh, so this is the weight of your variation of our structure. So you center everything at zero, and then you take this f infinity that I defined last time, which is the limit uh, hot filtration uh, obtained uh, by the nilpotent orbit theorem. Uh, then this is a mixed hot structure. Okay. And uh, what is the next step? The next step is that those uh, weight filtration are compatible when J runs through a descending set of indices. So you have a complicated compatibility between those things. Uh, so let's write this. So let T be uh, really one T, and this is where you fix the order of the variables. Otherwise, you, uh, if you fix a different order, you get a different result. Then you can write, I will write, there's a nice notation introduced by Javier in his uh, survey, which are much better than the one in our paper, but uh, uh, so you define it as being uh, the weight filtration associated to this facet uh, shifted by minus k for each uh, t between uh, 1 and n. So t is uh, now underlined to remember that you really look at this as being this, that subset. And then uh, the claim is that all uh, n in CT in this facet, they preserve the previous uh, filtration, W uh, T minus 1, and you still have a uh, 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 hard left shift uh, for free in that setting. And uh, n to the L uh, in that facet CT maps uh, the Greux uh, L plus uh, J the, uh, WT, uh, Greux uh, J uh, WT uh, minus 1 uh, as an isomorphism to uh, Greux uh, minus uh, L uh, plus uh, J of uh, wt gr uh, w t minus 1 uh, j okay. so morally speaking what this means is that uh, 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 the nilpotent orbit in many variable uh, will be sharply approximated by an sl2 to the n orbit 
Once you fix the order of the variables and you restrict to the corresponding sector sigma n that I considered uh, in the statement. This is morally what it means, uh, what is proven later in the uh, Catani uh, Kaplan Schmidt paper, but that I don't need. So uh, now, uh, how does the asymptotic work? Well, you start with uh, n, so let uh, w, n, and f uh, be the R split. So each time you have to uh, come back to R split stuff, so this is really painful. So B the R split uh, mixed start structures associated to uh, the first mixed start structure uh, given here, uh, associated to uh, Wn and f infinity, right? So you start with Wn f infinity, then you R split it, and I call this R splitting, uh, the new Hodge filtration is f. Okay. Then, uh, using the compatibility that I've written above, it would give you a multigrading, in fact, of VC. So, uh, using the compatibility of uh, the filtrations uh, WT, uh, one can refine, one refines uh, the link splitting for uh, one weight filtration. Uh, into a multigrading, into a multi-splitting, into a multi-grading, uh, VC can really be written as a sum for all R, S1, and Sn of I, R, S1, uh, Sn, such that uh, the filtration Fp is uh, the sum for R larger than P of the I, R, S1, Sn. Uh, and uh, WLT, now for all T, uh, is the sum for uh, R plus ST uh, smaller than L of IR S1 SN. Okay. So for, uh, if you look only at the weight filtration associated to T, you take only into account the uh, T's variable ST. Okay, so uh, you get this. this is for the Sorry? This is on the list of the so this F is the uh, Hodge filtration that I've introduced here. And I'm stating that you get a multigrading that gives you, in fact, all uh, the weight filtrations. Uh, Okay, so now I need uh, one more piece of notation for introducing the uh, Kashiwa norm it estimates. So uh, as uh, G of C acts uh, transitively holomorphically on uh, the uh, check, uh, we can write. Yeah, this is completely, everything is canonical. There are uh, unique multigrading satisfying those properties. But you also need the No, but of course, I have to give all the compatibility with the conju complex conjugate for each variable, and I, I don't want to do that. Right? Uh, this, is, this is the same conditions as for doing splitting, but f this is true for all. Okay, you have condition covered. Yeah, there are additional. Okay, sorry. So there are additional conditions so that this is uniquely defined once you have fixed those conditions. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, the complex group acts transitively on this uh, dual flag variety, so we can write. So recall that uh, we had this uh, uh, twisted uh, period map that descended to the disk, and uh, uh, we can write psi of t as being uh, just an element g of t in f, and in for uh, some holomorphic function, for a holomorphic function. G from uh, delta n to G of C. Okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, in fact, if you want more details, there exists a unique holomorphic uh, V function from delta n to uh, this direct uh, 
sum uh, A and B negative of G A B uh, such that G of T is exponential V of T. So you can choose uniquely uh, this v G in some sense is also, uh, well, it's not canonical, but you have a, can a natural choice, let's say. Psi, <laughs> I did not <laughs> introduce this notation. <laughs> so you have phi, which is uh, your period map, at the phi tilde, which was the period map at the level of the universal cover. Yeah. Then you untwist it by the monodromy to kill the monodromy, and you get a function psi tilde, but now this is invariant under the monodromy, so it descends to a function psi from uh, uh, delta n uh, to d. Check. For to the function? No from delta n, it extends by, uh, this is delta star to the n, but the result of uh, Schmidt uh, that I explained last time tells you that it extends to delta n, and it goes to the dual flag variety. Okay. okay. It was a twist that I introduced last time. All right, so with all those notations, uh, what is uh, uh, what is the result of Kashiwa and Katani kaplan schmidt about uh, Hodge norms? So the theorem due to Kashiwara in 85 and then Katani kaplan schmidt give a very uh, similar proof uh, in 86 uh, is that uh, for all z in Hn, uh, well, we have this, this, this uh, Hodge norm, then and for, uh, uh, for you, ah, sorry? <laughs> ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> All due respect. Uh, uh, the theorem is that uh, for... Uh, um, ah, I forgot this. Well, maybe I should uh, mention it. Uh, yeah, sorry, I need one more piece of notation that I forgot is now you can glue together uh, this by grading. Uh, so notice that everything is only over R. But after all, those weight filtrations are also defined over Q. So you can glue these things together to obtain, uh, we know that all weight, all WT are rational. And so you get uh, a multigrading VQ, which is really the sum for all S1 Sn uh, in Zn of uh, Js1 uh, Sn uh, with uh, Js1 Sn is the really the Gre Sn uh, for Wn, then the Gre Sn minus 1 Wn minus 1, then the Gre S1 W uh, S1 W1 uh, and uh, uh, such that uh, the WT uh, L is the sum for ST smaller than L J S1 SN. So I let you write with this description, I let you write the expression of the J S1 SN in terms of the I R S1 SN. You have to make a sum, I mean, you just write what it means and then you get it. Okay. Yeah. Once more. Uh, because it is deduced from this uh, I guy, which was unique modulo the uh, conditions that I did not give. Okay, so now uh, the theorem of Kashiwara. So I, could, I can put many K, right? Uh, and then uh, Katani. Kaplan Schmidt is that uh, for uh, you uh, in the piece, so you want to understand the asymptotic of the Hodge norm. So, but it, of course, it will depend on the uh, piece of the weight filtration where you are. So, if you are in that piece, then as a function of uh, z in sigma n, so you will uh, uh, get an asymptotic on that sector, uh, then uh, the result of Kashiwara is that uh, this 
uh, function is of that form, then uh, um, uh, you also need to understand what happens when you twist by the model Romy. And then this is equivalent to the same kind, exactly the same expression. Of course, not necessarily for the same constant, but and then uh, C is that uh, HZ now of this gamma of Z. Uh, what was what, what did I, what did I do with the gamma of Z? Uh, the gamma of Z was uh, this function. Uh, 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 here, sorry, I have to uh, twist again by the moment Romy because this gives you psi and now you want to go back to phi. So, uh, so in some sense this function is a function that control uh, the distance between the multi SL2 orbit and uh, your nilpotent orbit. So, uh, and then you also have uh, the same kind uh, of asymptotic in the sense that this is asymptotic to the previous one. Easy uh, and uh, U. Okay. So this is the theorem of on the norms. Now, uh, if you look. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, the proposition A, which was uh, the fact that uh, these functions are roughly uh, polynomial and roughly monomial, then you will deduce directly uh, from these estimates. So I will not make the detail, but it follows from that. So uh, proposition A uh, follows from uh, that result, uh, theorem. And uh, 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 now for the basis E, so for B you need to exhibit uh, uh, the basis E. So for the basis E, well, you choose any basis adapted to this uh, multi-grade, multi-decomposition. Yes? Yeah, so the C, the left-hand side does not depend on S1, Sn, and the right-hand side does. Sorry? No, it does. Uh, Z. This is as a function. U is, yeah, I'm sorry, this is... In C, in C, in part, uh, in, in part C, uh, uh, it, uh, it was, uh, sorry, that is U. Yeah, and, and, and then I'm just, just saying that those two functions are essentially the same, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, so what is the basis that you choose? You choose any basis uh, um, compatible with uh, this uh, decomposition. Yeah. Uh, choose any basis of uh, VQ adapted to uh, the decomposition uh, in terms of uh, the JS1SN. Uh, and then uh, you have to, to check that the condition C uh, is satisfied, which was the product of the values. And then the crucial thing is that everything here is centered around zero. So this means in particular that j s1 sn and j minus s1 minus sn, they have the same dimension. Uh, because the weight filtrations are centered in zero. And then the estimate A e that you get here then estimate A. So when you will make the product, you will see appearing, uh, you, th that space will compensate that one in those products. You will have uh, Y1 over Y2 S1, but there will be also Y1 to the Y2 to the minor S1. And they will appear in the same numbers because they have the same dimension. So, uh, so you will get the estimate from estimate A, you get uh, the condition C. on the product of uh, the value of uh, age z of the EI. About the determinant, you know it is, it is uh, bound of the... Forget the determinant, I don't want... <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so this is roughly uh, the proof. So if you are not disgusted, uh, let's move to something uh, uh, less technical. So, but the, the rough idea is that the original idea you wanted to prove that you knew the theorem in dimension one for n is equal to one, and uh, what you are missing is some kind of uniformity. So, at the beginning, I was hoping that, in some sense, some nice statement like uh, suppose you have a, a holomorphic function which is definable in some minimal structure in restrictions to each holomorphic curve. Then, is it true that this is uh, globally uh, definable in that? Uh, uh, minimal structures. So for real algebraic maps, you have theorem like that. And here, I even don't think that this is, I, I don't see how to prove this, and I'm not, I don't think, uh, I don't think this is true. I think probably you can construct a counter example. But here you see, I mean, you go a little bit further, you really need uh, precise estimates, uh, more precise estimates in dimension one, and then uh, this works. Well, of course, I would prefer a cleaner statement. But, uh, is there a spec theorem for real algebraic maps? I think if you have a if you have a real analytic function which in restrictions to uh, all uh, let's say even lines or real algebraic curves uh, is it real algebraic then this is globally real algebraic. Okay. And how the restricted analytic functions appear in this uh, a proposition a? Well, because anyway, I mean, they come everywhere here. You see, I mean, in this case of, of business, w the untwisted thing descends and extend to uh, delta n. So here, here you have typically uh, the kind of things that appear, right? Those functions are of this kind. But are they the just holomorphic function on, on These are all the, th the functions that appear that can be extended to delta n. And they appear many times. They appear in the nilpotent orbit theorem, and they appear here again. So they are real analytic or...? Co or uh, they are real analytic. The statement. I don't care about uh, anything. Anything holomorphic is is of no interest. Yeah, in real analytic actually on an open uh, containing zero. Contain uh, containing zero. Uh, this is why it has to be defined on something compact. Some something compact. Okay, but it is contains zero. It is yeah, yeah, it contains zero. I mean, yeah, sure. All right. Uh, so, uh, in the first lecture, uh, I stated the direct application to catani doing kaplan uh, theorem, and I gave uh, roughly the proof, so I will not repeat it. You just see that uh, your Hodge locus is a pre image of something uh, definable and uh, holomorphic, so uh, it has to be definable and holomorphic, and so this is algebraic in S. And then there was this theorem by Baker and Brunmar and Zimmerman saying that essentially uh, the image of the period map uh, as a canonical uh, structure of uh, quasi-projective variety. Uh, I've prepared this, but it would, I mean, in some sense, I don't think the proof is really enlightening. So you have to, you have to develop a, a, a formalism of a Gaga formalism for uh, definable uh, complex analytic uh, uh, spaces. This is nice, but uh, I prefer to move on to. Uh, Transcendence. OK. So of course, we can discuss it uh, outside the lecture, if you want. All right, so uh, part uh, uh, three, um, so by algebraic geometry and transcendence. So let me start with some, uh, let maybe, uh, philosophical remarks. So um, the way I see uh, variations of attraction, in some sense, is just a way of algebraically controlling universal covers of uh, the identification of complex algebraic varieties. Right. So uh, this is a basic fact that you, uh, over C, you really have existence of uh, universal cover. So if you start with uh, something algebraic, uh, then you can look at the associated uh, complex analytic space. And then you get the following picture that you have a universal cover, which is not true in general. Right? Uh, if you work in a more restricted uh, setting of uh, uh, any field. And uh, it's very classical uh, that you can use this picture. So you have a group acting on that complex space, and such that that guy is a quotient. And uh, the, the first remark is that uh, usually if this group uh, is infinite, 
then you really leave the category of algebraic space, right? I mean, this guy will just be complex analytic without any algebraic structure. But nevertheless, I mean, since the start of complex algebraic geometry, uh, that picture has been much used to study, uh, to study complex algebraic varieties. I mean, uh, basically, it was used by uh, Euler to study elliptic curves, uh, by Abel to study abelian varieties, and whatever. So, uh, So it gives you a completely, in some sense, a bit different uh, perspective on complex algebraic variety, which is not really uh, algebraic anymore. So let me make some remark. So if you look at those pictures, there are two uh, basic questions. Uh, the first basic question uh, is that, uh, what are the finitely presented groups that can appear here? That uh, gamma, that can be by one S n, where S is, uh, let's say, quasi-projective or even projective. And uh, almost nothing is known about that question. It's a classical uh, question of Serre, and we know almost never nothing about that. The second question is that uh, complex analytic geometry is kind of wild. I mean, complex analytic space are much more complicated than uh, complex algebraic varieties. And so you can ask, uh, what are the general uh, geometric uh, uh, structures that you can expect for universal covers? And here, uh, there is only one guided conjecture. So let me uh, mention it. So this is a Shafarovich conjecture. Yes, 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 yes. Sure. So it's a classical theorem of the link that if you do not fix any uh, restrictions, then you can realize any, of course. And uh, the proof uh, is very easy. Um, so uh, what is Shafarovich? So from now on, S is smooth. Um, what is Shafarovich conjecture? Um, at least if S is projective, it tells you that uh, if you uh, look at these universal covers, in, it has to be holomorphically convex. Well, I don't know if you have to call this a conjecture. In, in his book, this is written as a question rather than a conjecture, but people now uh, talk about a conjecture. So let me remind you what it means in, uh, in terms of geometry. This means that you have a proper uh, vibration of a uh, uh, Stein space. So there exists phi uh, proper uh, vibration uh, over R, and R is Stein. So something compact over something affine, if you think in algebraic terms, OK? Uh, so as I said, the main remark is that uh, if pi 1 of Sn is infinite, which is the case which is of interest, because if it is finite, then this guy is just an etal finite etal cover of S. So it is also algebraizable by the classical result of, uh, I don't know, Riemann. Or so to th for this picture to be of interest, you have to work with uh, infinite finite groups. And uh, then uh, usually, uh, S and tilde has no algebraic structure. So of course, uh, there is a clear exception, which is the case of abelian varieties, which is a striking example. But uh, basically, there is a recent result telling you that you, you have no other. So there is a theorem due uh, to Clodon, uh, Collar, and Hering. OK, this is conditional to uh, the abundance conjecture, but I think everybody in this topic believe it. So uh, let S be even normal, uh, projective over C. So here I'm talking about the projective case. There are results in the quasi-projective case, but uh, not as clear. So assume uh, the abundance conjecture which is the last step missing in the uh, minimal model program, um, at least for a, a neophyte like me. Uh, so it tells you that if S is not unirolled, um, then uh, its canonical bundle is eventually uh, base point free. sufficiently large, OK? So assume this conjecture. <coughs> then, um, sorry? The, the canonical band, you assume it is Q Cartier? Or? Yeah, Q Cartier, OK. Uh, anyway, I'm interested in the smooth case. I don't care. 
あああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああ
So now the universal cover is not algebraic. It's an Hermitian symmetric domain. But as we have seen, uh, so Uh, uh, this embeds as an open set uh, in something which is algebraic, which is this flag variety, and this is uh, uh, this map is even G equivalent, and gamma is contained in G, so this is so edge from uh, gamma to G of R to G of C, and G of C is uh, uh, automorphism of the algebraic automorphism of uh, of the check. Okay, and uh, so still here, this is a nice example because, as I said, I mean, this is really an embedding. But now you see that the variations of our structures are just uh, uh, more general uh, examples than example two, and where uh, it might be possible that you lose some uh, dimension. I mean, this period map is not an immersion uh, anymore. So you start now with any uh, smooth quasi-projective over C and suppose that you have a variation of a structure. So now you want to test the algebraicity of the universal cover by looking at variation of a structure. So you fix one, a non-trivial uh, ZVHS. In particular, you assume that the pi one of S n is infinite and then uh, you have uh, your period map uh, to uh, D, which is uh, G mod V, and then the map that you are really looking at, your F uh, for the definition, is again, uh, you uh, put it in the dual flag guy. But of course, now this is more complicated. Uh, you don't really understand that map. Uh, S an uh, phi tilde has no reason to be uh, an isomorphism, and of course, in general, it is not. But still, uh, this is a algebraic structure in the sense that I defined. Define. Okay. Uh, Good. So, uh, in to which extent can you understand uh, these bi-algebraic structures as really uh, putting an algebraic structure on the universal cover? Well, at least you can define uh, algebraic subvarieties. So, uh, we say that uh, V, an algebraic irreducible, ah, okay, sorry, analytic irreducible uh, subvariety of uh, the universal cover is said to be algebraic. algebraic with respect to the uh, bi-algebraic structure that you have fixed to the bi-algebraic structure on S uh, if, well, it is a pre-image uh, by that map F of something algebraic here. If uh, V is F minus 1 of something algebraic, but now you know what is the something algebraic. It has to be the Zariski closure of the image. So you can even say this. And uh, while well, there is a problem of irreducible components, so if it is an irreducible component of that pre-image. OK. And second, now what is the transcendence problem that you want to study? Uh, you start with Y algebraic now in S uh, and irreducible. Then it is bi-algebraic. So the idea is that if you look at something algebraic in the universal cover, of course, it is algebraic with respect to x, to this morphism, but it has nothing to do with the algebraic structure on S. So when you project it back, uh, usually this is something disgusting, not even complex analytic. And so uh, there should be very few things which are algebraic at the same time upstairs and downstairs. And those guys are called bi-algebraic. So this guy is called bi-algebraic, uh, still with respect to the given uh, bi-algebraic structure. If uh, one, equivalently any uh, irreducible component, analytic component of uh, pi minus 1 of uh, y analytification uh, in S uh, and tilde is algebraic. In the first in sense is algebraic in the sense of 1. Okay. And the idea is that the collection of uh, algebraic subvarieties uh, will give you something interesting. So let me give you uh, examples of this. Uh, example one, so uh, you started with your abelian variety and you ask yourself what are the, uh, the bi-algebraic guys 
uh, 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 in your abelian uh, variety. And the claim is that uh, this is the same thing as being translate of an abelian sub variety. So really, you are uh, capturing something out of the uh, geometry. So uh, if you are bored, you can try to prove this. This is a nice exercise about uh, the universal property of the Albanese map. Okay? It's very easy, but OK. Uh, example two, so this was the case of uh, Shimura varieties. So uh, the result is due to Ulmo and Yaffa F is that uh, if you start with some algebraic irreducible subvariety of a Shimura variety, of a connected Shimura variety, then it is bi-algebraic if and only if, in terms of group theory, uh, Y is what is called uh, weakly special. So uh, let me not define this because I will define it in example three, which is more general. And, uh, but you can just think that uh, this means that OK, uh, Shimura variety, if you look at it as a complex uh, analytic space, it has a canonical uh, locally symmetric uh, emission metric. And then the claim is that it's the same thing as being totally geodesic. And this, this is due to Moonen. Uh, well, this equivalent, let's write it this way. Uh, this is due to Moonen. That this is the same thing as Y uh, totally geodesic for the canonical metric. So you see that uh, these notions of transcendence, in fact, they capture classical stuff about uh, locally uh, homogeneous spaces like uh, Shimura variety. And uh, well, uh, example three, uh, let's go back to uh, the case of uh, general variations of hot structures. So uh, this was properly done in a paper uh, by myself and uh, Odvinovska. Is that, uh, so suppose you have your D variation of a structure and you have your period map to uh, D. Um, then you are in this situation. Uh, then the claim is that uh, Y in uh, S, uh, irreducible algebraic, is bi-algebraic. Once again, if and only if uh, Y is weakly special. So I defined the notion of uh, special. Uh, special subvariety was a component of the Hodge locus. Weakly special is a bit more general. It is the following. So uh, let me uh, uh, tell you what it means. This means that that means that uh, Y is of the form. So uh, now notice that I'm restricting myself to the variation of a structure where I really have this. And this is the main problem in the theory. I will come back uh, at some point to this. So you're asking that Y is the pre-image of, of what? Of uh, S gamma 1, uh, G1, M1 cross a point, X, uh, where you have uh, one special uh, variety S gamma 1, G1, M1 cross S gamma 2, G2, M2, uh, embedded in S gamma GM. Right? So in S gamma GM, you have special subvarieties, which are exactly the guys of the same shape. It can happen that the guy of the same shape corresponds to a product group, G1 times G2. In that case, uh, the, uh, uh, this, comp this special subvariety will be a product. And then a weekly special is when you keep one of the non-trivial factor of the product, but the second factor is just replaced by a point. Right, so, and if you think in the case of Shimura variety, something uh, totally geodesic uh, will always be of that shape. Uh, okay, so uh, now that I've given you the basic uh, definition, uh, why do I think this is interesting? Well, uh, there is a full uh, heuristic about uh, this kind of structure, which is very rich. So first, there is a functional transcendence uh, heuristic, which has proven to be extremely useful for uh, solving a number theoretical uh, problem. So let me explain this now. Functional uh, transcendence uh, heuristic. Uh, for tame 
and this is where time geometry comes into the picture, bi-algebraic structure. So I did not define what is a time uh, bi-algebraic structure, and the reason is that I don't have, a, I don't have yet the right definition, but I will give you some indication what I mean by that. So, uh, but let me write first the heuristic. Suppose that S is endowed uh, with a time bi-algebraic structure. This is just a heuristic, so of course you can find counterexamples. This is no problem. But uh, it, it, it's used as a guide and uh, describing some similarities between different problems. So uh, let me not too brutal and explain first what is really uh, most geometrically uh, speaking to me. So the first thing is that, so this is called uh, Axe Lindemann. And it tells you that for any y in S n, uh, Al uh, algebraic in the sense of the algebraic structure and irreducible. Okay, so you have this guy which is algebraic in the universal cover. Sorry. Then you push it down by the projection to your uh, original variety. This is not even complex analytic, but you take the Zariski closure of that thing. Then uh, the projection of y, and then you take the Zariski closure, and the claim is that this guy is algebraic. So this is a, I think this is a very meaningful geometric statement. And there is a more general statement, which is really, uh, where you see that this is really a function transcendence, which is called axe general. And which says the following, uh, suppose that uh, you have u, let u in the product. So uh, this guy has naturally an underlying uh, algebraic structure because S is algebraic. And I'm considering the algebraic structure and the universal cover coming from my bi-algebraic structure. And now I take some guy here, which is algebraic for the product uh, bi-algebraic structure. Uh, bi-algebraic. Well, algebraic for the product structure. So this means that with respect to the universal cover, uh, it is bi-algebraic for the natural bi-algebraic structure on that product. The one coming from uh, the algebraic structure here and the bi-algebraic structure on the universal cover. So you require that when you push down to SN process R, you get something algebraic. And yes. And that when you go by the morphism to your variety cross SN, you get again. Yes. Uh, let W uh, be the intersection with the diagonal, where the diagonal is a graph of pi. And you take an analytic uh, irreducible component of this, where uh, delta is a graph of pi. Then uh, there is a very precise uh, dimension estimate. which always uh, confuses me, but uh, then uh, the conjecture is that uh, the co-dimension in U of uh, this W, so the thing you started with, is always larger than the uh, dimension of the smallest uh, bi-algebraic guy containing the projection of W. So this, is, this guy is the smallest uh, bi-algebraic sub-variety of S containing um, uh, pi 1 of W, uh, pi 2 of W, P2 of W. Right. Uh, w is living in that product. I project to the second factor, and I take the smallest bi-algebraic guys that contain it. OK. Uh, and then uh, Axe Lindemann is a special case of Axe Chenuel. Uh, for u of the form y cross uh, pi of y czar. So we take some guy which is algebraic, but uh, you take this guy of very specific form. You take it as being a product uh, with then uh, 2 uh, implies 1. Easy exercise. OK. So examples of this heuristic. 
uh, uh, one and two are theorem due to axe. So for example, axe Lindemann tells you that if you take an algebraic subvariety of C to the N and you push it down to your abelian variety, you take the Zariski closure, then this is a translate of an abelian subvariety. Okay? And action will give you a more precise uh, statement about dimensions uh, when you do this kind of uh, procedure. So example two, well, axe Lindemann is due uh, to myself, uh, Unmo and Yafaev. And uh, Axe Chanuel was uh, proven uh, more recently by um, Pilar Mock. So I think we proved this in uh, 14. And uh, Pilar Mock and Zimmerman. So I'm not sure when it was published. It, uh, I mean, the first draft appeared around 17, I think. Um, right? So this statement tells you that you start with a bounded symmetric domain. And you take the intersection of your bounded symmetric domain with something algebraic in the flag variety. You take a connected component, of an irreducible component of that. Then you project it to the Shimura variety. You take the Zariski closure. Then this is a weakly special submanifold. So it gives you a very uh, strong uh, information. Uh, <coughs> then. Uh, Then uh, example three, so the case of uh, variation of hot structures, so it was conjectured by me uh, in a paper that will maybe someday one appear if Javier managed to uh, make the proceedings. <laughs> uh, no pressure. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and this was uh, proven uh, last year by uh, Baker and Timmerman. So I, I, I think I had conjecture is something like uh, in 16, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, uh, uh, and now we are back to the first lecture because the main ingredient for proving all these kind of functional transcendence results is the other algebraization theorem uh, due to uh, Pilar-Wilke. So uh, let me think a bit about how I, I want to proceed. Uh, Yeah, those are just uh, 10 times too much uh, things. So um, maybe it's useful that uh, I don't want to give something uh, completely empty uh, for today, uh, for the second part. So maybe I will try to prove axe in demand for abelian varieties. So this is a baby case, but still, you see how it works. OK, so. So you see all the main ingredients. The main ingredients are a mixture of arguments on the monodromy and the application of pilar wilkie theorem. So, and tomorrow I will go uh, probably to try to explain some uh, action domain or action well in a hyperbolic uh, setting. So how does it work? So what is the theorem? I remind you, you start with an abelian variety. So you look at the uniformization map from, uh, let's say, of dimension G. And so you have a map from CG to uh, the identification AN, which is CG mod uh, lambda, where lambda is some uh, z to the power 2G. And now, uh, as I said, uh, one way of saying it is that you take something irreducible algebraic here, you uh, project it here, and you take the Zariski closure, and this is the translate of an abelian variety. But equivalently, you start, and this is easier to prove in some sense, it's just a matter of perspective, but you start with something uh, irreducible and algebraic in A, and uh, now you take uh, something uh, irreducible and algebraic in the pre-image of V. And uh, you take it maximal for this property. Maximal for this property of being uh, irreducible and algebraic contained in the pre-image for these properties. Uh, then uh, you want to prove that the projection of Y is a translate of an abelian subvariety. So this is the theorem due to X. And uh, now let me uh, give the proof. 
or at least idea of the proof, so that you see the ingredients. Uh, so uh, first thing that I do is that for simplicity, I will assume that A is simple. It's not a big deal, but uh, it makes uh, life easier. So assume A is simple. Y, uh, y is maximal uh, inside the preimage of uh, V and Etifier for the two properties of being irreducible and algebraic. Okay. So assume that A is simple, and then what you want to show, you want to show that uh, uh, V is equal to A. Uh, in that case, as soon as the dimension, right? Uh, well, let me let's say uh, uh, first reduce. Can you, you can assume replacing v by something smaller? You can assume that. Uh, uh, so you can inside v you will have pi of y uh, Zariski closure. So you can assume that this is v. If not, you replace v by something by this guy, which is smaller, and so uh, you have the same statement. Okay. So once you are there, what you want to show is that in fact v is equal to a, because you want to prove that v is a translate of an abelian subvariety, but uh, a is simple, so v has to be a. Okay. Uh, at least if the dimension of v, which is what I'm assuming, is uh, is uh, positive, you just don't take just a point, right? Okay, so uh, so uh, this is what is enough to show this, and this is important because it tells you that uh, you uh, really use the group of automorphism. Uh, you uh, want to show that the stabilizer uh, theta y, uh, which is a stabilizer in C G of y, is positive dimensional. Because if you prove this, then uh, you know that v, which will be uh, the uh, pi of y czar, uh, will be stable under uh, uh, the Zariski closure of this group projected uh, to a. But the Zariski closure of this group as a is simple as to be a. So you will prove that v is stable under a, so it has to be a. Okay, so uh, this is really the idea that uh, to prove this kind of uh, statement, you prove that uh, your y is very homogeneous. So how do you prove this? Well, this is where you use Pillar-Wilkie theorem. I remind you that Pillar-Wilkie tells you that if a definable entity contains sufficiently many uh, rational points, then it contains positive dimensional uh, semi-algebraic stuff. So uh, define sigma of y as being the set of elements in uh, your group Cg such that uh, y plus z uh, intersected with the fundamental domain of the action of gamma is different from the empty set and y plus z is contained in the preimage of v. Okay. So uh, what is the picture? The picture is that uh, uh, I have, uh, well, first I have my uh, fundamental domain. So let's uh, look at it as being a cube, maybe. Right? Uh, so I have my uh, big cube, which is my fundamental set F. And then gamma acts by translation on this in the universal cover. So I have uh, pi minus 1 of v. So let's imagine this is something really analytic. Of course, I'm not able to uh, draw this. But uh, I guess I get something like uh, this pi minus 1 of v intersected with f. OK? And uh, now I have my y, which is algebraic. So in some, morally speaking, it's much less curved because it is algebraic. So it's living here. And now I'm trying to translate. Uh, my y, uh, so this is y, and then I'm trying to translate uh, y by uh, some element. 
So that, uh, of course, this guy, if I translate, it's still algebraic, because y was algebraic, so this is no problem. Uh, such that I'm still cutting the fundamental set, and I'm still contained in the preimage of v. Okay? So I'm trying to deform my y into uh, something uh, still algebraic. So of course, uh, now, uh, because I want to use pillar Wilkie, I take f as being semi-algebraic. So in my case, just a, a regular a usual cube. Uh, and then you see that uh, this set sigma of i is in fact nothing else than the set of sigma in Cg, such that uh, the dimension of y plus z intersected with f uh, intersected with pi minus 1 of v is the same thing as the dimension of y. So now, in the case of abelian variety, uh, uh, of course, the uniformization map is not definable in any minimal structure because this is uh, periodic. But uh, this thing from the fundamental domain is trivially uh, are undefinable because everything is compact. So here, there is no uh, problem. Of course, there is a problem for Shimura varieties or for variation of our structures. So this implies that if you look at this definition, the dimension is a definable function. And uh, this guy, by definition, will be uh, definable. This is uh, algebraic. And this is algebraic. So uh, this implies that sigma of y inside Cg is uh, undefinable. I don't care that this is Rn. I just care that this is some minimal structure. And so uh, what I want to show, I just want to show that that guy contains some positive uh, uh, dimensional semi-algebraic set. This is enough. And to do that, I use uh, pillar Wilkie, right? So why is that enough? So this is enough to show that sigma of y contains a positive dimensional uh, semi-algebraic set, W, because in that case, uh, for any uh, 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 then by maximality of y, then uh, we'll have that y plus w is equal to y. Because otherwise, I will, if my w acts uh, semi-algebraically and uh, I look at what it generates with y, then I will get something algebraic of higher dimension, still contained in pi minus 1 of v. No, but you don't know if w contains the origin. Maybe it is a little bit shifted away. So you know that y plus w maybe is bigger dimension there, but maybe it doesn't contain y. OK, I have to be careful to shift everything to 0. OK. Let's be, let's be careful about, not be careful about the details, but uh, this is the argument. I'm just saying that I'm creating a larger dimensional algebraic families containing y and still contained in pi minus 1 of v. Okay? Um, you can shift because you don't have something. No, but you will see that I, I, I produce something that contains 0 anyway. So. Um, Okay, and uh, then I will be here, and then I will be done, uh, because then I will know that this stabilizer contains that W. So this implies that W is contained in theta Y, and I'm done. Okay, so uh, to do that, uh, we apply pillar Wilkie, and so we have to count rational points. So of course, the rational points will be count they are counted in the group CG with respect to the uh, integral structure given by the lattice lambda. So uh, what I count is really the intersection of sigma of y uh, with lambda. And then uh, you see that this is the set. If you uh, make, if you try to uh, understand what are the integral elements here, then you see that they are just the guy such that th this problem becomes much simpler. You are just counting uh, the element in your lattice such that when you translate uh, y by this element, you are still intersecting uh, the fundamental set. Right? So you have your lattice. You have your y, which is algebraic. In particular, it is, it's uh, going to infinity. And you are just counting all. Uh, so you have your reference f. And if you want, you are just uh, taking back y uh, to uh, your original uh, fundamental set by an element. And you are counting the number of elements. Okay? And the claim, uh, which is an easy exercise, is that now you count uh, the set of elements that appear in pillar Wilkie. So you take this element there, such that the height of z 
is uh, smaller than t. And then you will see that uh, the height of z is essentially uh, the ln infinity norm with respect to lambda. Okay? Nothing else. And so it's easy to see that this is uh, larger, for t sufficiently large, this is larger than t over 2. The idea is that each time you go to an, an, another uh, uh, fundamental set, then the height moves at most by 1. It moves by 1, exactly. Okay? So, and so you get this, and then you apply Pila Wilkie. It tells you that uh, this definable set, sigma of y, contains al at least polynomially many in the height uh, uh, rational points, in fact, integral points. And so it has to contain a positive dimensional uh, semi algebraic set. Okay? And so you are done. So this is a proof of uh, axe in demand uh, in that case. Okay, so. Uh, after th so you have seen uh, most of the ingredients, you have some problem of uh, tameness. You have to prove that some maps restricted to fundamental sets are tame. Here this is trivial, but in all the other cases this is uh, deep. You have to use the monodromy. Here this is very simple because the monodromy is a billion. And you have to understand the height. And once more here this is very simple because everything is flat. The height is just the in L infinity norm with respect to the lattice. Of course, in the case of Shimura varieties, this is much more subtle. This is related to the Riemannian distance. You have to really compare what happens, and you use non-positive curvature. But uh, this is basically the idea. And for variation of a structure, well, you have to use the non-positivity uh, curvature in the horizontal direction, which are the only ones that uh, the period map C. OK. Good. So uh, now the point of all this is that uh, out of this uh, functional transcendence heuristic, uh, you can transport this notion of algebraic structure of a Q bar, and then you will get really a true functional, uh, true uh, transcendence problem, and some atypical uh, intersection heuristic. So a uh, definition, a Q bar uh, algebraic structure is a algebraic structure uh, S and tilde uh, as before, such that by algebraic structure such of a C, such that uh, S is defined over Q bar, so that space, X is defined over Q bar, and uh, the monodromy uh, takes value in the automorphism of a Q bar of X. Okay, so you are just enriching, enriching the data of a, a Q bar. And uh, in particular, this gives you, uh, this will define you a notion of Q bar by algebraic subvarieties. So this will be the algebraic subvarieties of a C, such that they are defined over Q bar in S, and they are the pre image of something defined over Q bar in X. Okay, so this makes sense. And uh, what is interest is that, well, with my uh, naive definition of a C, all the points were by algebraic. But here now you also have a notion of Q bar by algebraic points. In particular, you get the notion uh, uh, of uh, a Q bar uh, by algebraic point is a point S uh, in S of Q bar, uh, such that there exists an S tilde in uh, uh, the identification uh, in the universal cover, such that uh, f of S tilde belongs to x of q bar, and pi of s tilde is s, right? So you have a point here of a q bar, a point there, and uh, they define the same guy. OK, so example one. So uh, this is a case of uh, algebraic variety, uh, abelian varieties of a q bar. Here the story is a bit subtle, because you have to understand what is the q, the q bar structure that you put on the universal cover. So canonically, the universal cover is the Lie algebra of A. So you could put the natural Q structure on the, Lie, uh, the Q bar structure on the Lie algebra of A, right? And this, so you would have Lie of A, and here the map would be Lie of A uh, of a Q bar. Uh, then uh, take C and then uh, identify. Well, this would be your X with this Q bar structure, and here uh, this is A C and. There's a projection to A. If you do this, uh, there is a result, a classical result of transcendence theory by Lang, telling you that there are no Q bar uh, by algebraic points except uh, the identity of the abelian variety. So clearly, this is not, and this is where uh, now things become tricky. 
So if A has complex multiplication, then the right Q bar structure is given by the lattice of periods. Okay? And then, if you take this, you prove that the Q bar by algebraic points are exactly the torsion points. If you want, uh, of course, TM and varieties are defined over Q bar, so this is a particular case of what you want. And in general, uh, it's more tricky. You have to use the universal uh, uh, vector extension of your algebraic variety to really define uh, the, by the Q bar by algebraic points. And then they coincide with, again with the torsion points. But you see that the Betty picture enter into the picture because uh, the nature of lattice is really the lattice of periods. Yeah. Which is normal, you are working at the level of the universal cover. There is no reason to take the Lie algebra with its naive uh, Q-bar structure. Um, so I am not saying, I'm not giving more details, so just that this one is not the right one. Uh, example two. So, uh, well, you can first look at, so this is the case of Shimura variety. You can just take the first the case of the middle curve uh, y0 of 1. So by the j function, this is c. And so uh, here, this is your embedding inside p1c, right? This is uh, your model. And here, everything is naturally defined over q bar. And so uh, what are the q bar by algebraic points? You are looking in for tau in h intersected with q bar, such that j of uh, uh, tau uh, is in q bar. These are your uh, by algebraic points bar by algebraic points, and it's well known uh, by Schneider theorem that this is the same thing as asking that, uh, in fact, uh, it's in, you are not in Q bar, but you are imaginary quadratic. And this means that uh, your point Z, which is pi of tau, so your Z here, or if you want J of tau, um, as complex multiplication, so X is the same point. So the point in your modular curve parameterized by j of tau is a point with complex multiplication. So you are exactly parameterizing what you want, uh, the point with complex multiplication in your uh, uh, modular curve. And in general, uh, you get exactly the same result. Um, by uh, So this is due to, uh, in general, so this is current here. And in general, uh, you get the same. So the q bar by algebraic points. Well, for, for a billion variety, uh, for Shimura varieties of billion type, where you have a modular interpretation, this is the same thing as CM point. Example three, uh, global variation of our structures, and then a complete mystery. Okay? And this is related to a deep problem like uh, Hodge implies absolute Hodge. And so, uh, no idea. This is open. So uh, what is uh, 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 the uh, heuristic that you get uh, once you go to Q bar? Uh, so this is a typical intersection heuristic. Uh, which is a, uh, a Q bar analog of uh, the previous uh, heuristic. So this is for tame Q bar by algebraic structure. Yeah, so I did not explain exactly what I mean by tame, but it means that the tame geometry has to enter at some point. So I can give you more details if you want later. It's not yet clear. Uh, I mean, I have a, in all the cases that I'm giving, uh, they are obviously tame for some reasons, but uh, they are, this is uh, not enough for what I want to do in general. Uh, so uh, let S uh, be uh, endowed with a tame Q bar uh, by algebraic structure. Then uh, any irreducible algebraic subvariety of S uh, containing a Zariski dense there is a dense uh, set of uh, Q bar by algebraic points is a Q bar by algebraic subvariety. Right, so this is a heuristic. So what does this heuristic uh, give you uh, in the examples? 
Well, uh, for a billion variety of a Q bar, uh, this is Reynolds theorem. This is Manny Mumford conjecture. So, uh, example one. Uh, so, uh, this, tell, this is Manny Mumford for uh, A over Q bar. So, a theorem of Reynolds. Right, so you have an abelian variety defined over Q bar, and uh, and uh, you take uh, near this sub variety uh, uh, containing uh, the Heisky dense set of torsion points, and it, uh, it, uh, then the guy has to be a translate of an abelian variety by a torsion point. Uh, example two, uh, this is André Orff conjecture. So if you have a an irreducible subvariety of Shimura variety containing the Heisky dense set of uh, CM points, then it has to be a special subvariety, which is the same thing as a Q-bar by algebraic subvariety. Uh, OK, so I guess I have uh, uh, two minutes uh, remaining. So maybe I'll try to uh, give you the proof of uh, many of our Freno theorem uh, uh, using uh, this business of time geometry. So what I claim is that basically uh, once you go over a Q bar, so uh, proof of uh, a man in Mumford in that case. So basically I, what I claim is that the proof is first you use what you know over C, namely uh, um, uh, a functional transcendence given by action demand or action real. And then you have to use some uh, kind of big Galois orbits. So you have to have an information about the Galois size uh, of uh, your special points, of your uh, by Q bar by algebraic points. So again. Example 2, you mean under our conjecture for Shimura varieties of abelian type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Under our conjecture for abelian, for uh, Shimura var The problem is that I don't know the characterization of uh, Q bar by algebraic for not of abelian type. Uh, I expect them to be the CM points, but uh, nobody knows. OK, so uh, yeah, I'm a bit late, but let's take uh, three minutes to do that. So again, I put myself in the simplest case where uh, A of a Q bar is simple. It's not a big uh, problem to restrict to this. So what was my picture of a C? I had my fundamental domain, which was semi-algebraic uh, in CG, so my, just my usual cube. And then I had pi, and then I had uh, the identification of my Ubin variety, which was CG mod lambda. And uh, we know that this projection in restricts, so this map here is uh, undefinable. And so uh, uh, now uh, suppose that I have V inside uh, uh, A, so of a Q bar, uh, such that uh, containing, such, uh, containing uh, infinitely containing the Heisky dense set of torsion points. And I want to prove that this is A, because I'm in the simple case. So uh, this is a picture here. So uh, how does it work? Well, the first thing is that uh, uh, by axing the man, we can suppose that pi minus 1 of V uh, intersected with the fundamental uh, domain does not contain any uh, positive dimensional semi-algebraic set. Because if it were, by axing demand, this would imply that uh, V is already A. Otherwise, uh, this means that V contains positive dimensional semi-algebraic stuff. So when I push uh, down, then uh, necessarily uh, I'm equal to my Zariski closure, because uh, V is algebraic, and then this would be A. Otherwise, uh, V would be A, and I would be done. So this is where I use uh, what I know of a C. So now, uh, what is the second kind of uh, 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 statement that I need? I need uh, to say, uh, what is the size of uh, uh, Galois orbits of torsion points? Uh, and there, I use pillar wilkin in the other direction. So uh, first, by pillar wilkie this will tell me that I, I contain very few, uh, there exists a constant C epsilon, such that the cardinal of Z in pi minus 1 of V intersected with F, such that the height of Z is smaller than T, uh, is 
smaller than C epsilon T epsilon. So it grows sub polynomially by pillar Wilk because there is nothing algebraic in it. Okay. This is good. So now I want to prove the finiteness. I have to prove that, uh, on the other hand, the Galois orbits are big. So uh, on the other hand, uh, if P is a torsion point, uh, so P is pi of Z, where Z is in the finital set, uh, then what is the height of Z? Well, by definition, this is exactly the order of P. Okay, and so uh, now uh, you have a classical result of masse for uh, abelian varieties of a Q bar that tells you that uh, uh, if you look at the Galois orbit, so let's suppose that A is defined over K, where K is a number field, and then you take the Galois Q bar of a K uh, orbit of your torsion point, then the cardinal of that thing, which is the same thing as the degree of the field generated by uh, K and P, uh, is larger than C times uh, the height of Z, so the order of the torsion point to some constant rho. Uh, uh, so what is important, where uh, C depends only on A, and in fact rho, it's even better, rho depends only on dim of A. So in that case, in fact, I just need that it depends only on A. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, now you look at uh, this equality one, this inequality here, and this inequality two. And so uh, from one plus two, you deduce that the height of your torsion points, or if you, uh, the height of the premise of the torsion point is a fundamental set, or if you want the order of the torsion points is uh, uniformly bounded. So any torsion points uh, uh, point on V as a bounded order. Uh, Offer will not like this sentence. Um, there is a constant uniformly bounding the order of the torsion points in V. Uh, so you have only finitely many. Okay, so you are done. OK, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit late. Uh, I will stop here. And uh, tomorrow, um, I will talk about, uh, uh, so you see the problem for variations of a structure is that I don't know how to characterize the Q-bar by algebraic points, because this is difficult transcendent theory. So what I would explain is that I replace these notions uh, by uh, adequate uh, atypical intersection conjectures uh, for variation of a structure. So I want to state this and maybe give an example then uh, maybe uh, try to give a hint how to prove the kind of action annual but in a curved uh, context. And then the second hour will be devoted to the proof of the original theorem 4, which is not a typical intersection, but typical intersection, and where nevertheless you still use uh, some uh, functional uh, transcendence result. Okay, so I stop here uh, for today.